I've often been quoted as saying I would rather be governed by the first 2,000 people in the Boston Telephone Directory than by the 2,000 people on the faculty of Harvard University. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. They share our beliefs, our convictions, our hopes, and our dreams. These are the conservatives of the heart. They are our people. Join the best in the movement. It's Conservative Conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with James and Johnny. How are you doing, James? I'm doing well, Johnny. This week, we have a student member question from Jack Scalia, and he asks, what is the state of conservatism in the U.S.? What is the way forward? And do we still have politicians that embody conservative principles? If so, Johnny, what do you think? Yeah, that's a fantastic question and actually relates to a panel that will be on tomorrow evening with Stephanie Slade talking about the state of the conservative movement and also the philosophy of fusionism that was popularized by Frank Meyer and was also embodied by many people like our founder, Bill Buckley. Um, You know, so I think overall the state of conservatism in the U.S., uh, you know, I, I would say I pin it less directly to the outcomes of elections, and I look at it more fundamentally in terms of, you know, what how are conservative institutions doing? And for me, the con- most conservative real institutions are really the family, uh, the church, and the local institutions in civil society. So if if those institutions are healthy, then I c- think conservative conservatism is doing well. And if they are faring poorly, I think we're in trouble. And as you'll hear from our conversation today, I think there's a broad agreement among conservatives of all stripes uh, that is that is that it is time to begin rebuilding our institutions. Uh, James, what do you what do you see as the way forward? Yeah, you know, I, I agree with that. Looking to the main institutions of conservatism is a good way to see if if conservatism is healthy. I also would know, you know, on the sort of intellectual side of conservatism, what is the state of conservative intellectual um, discourse? I think it's some people might be uh, might be less happy about it or more happy about it, given, you know, which way we might be leaning at any moment. But um, but I think overall we're seeing a real vibrancy of uh, of discourse in around the question what is conservatism and you know we're seeing this in public discourse seeing it in law and liberty we're seeing it in tack in a lot of places and so I think in that sense you know there is um, hopefully um, an intellectual health which will help us to rebuild our institutions as well yeah certainly I think so and I think a lot of uh, you know one of the big challenges of uh, the conservative movement, which has less to do with the the particular philosophy of fusionism and more to do with the coalition that formed in the 20th century, you know, the combination that people have talked about over and over again, the three-legged stool of foreign policy hawks, uh, the religious right and libertarians, um, you know, that coalition it didn't form and, you know, just wasn't a group of people sitting around their dorm room saying, you know, what's the perfect synthesis of our ideology? It was really, you know, the result of there was uh, two threats, one one foreign and one domestic, the Soviet Union abroad and the rise of collectivism uh, following the New Deal at home. And so, you know, these three groups basically found themselves as bedfellows and united uh, and it, you know, began as an intellectual movement, and then it was popularized, and eventually um, was embodied by the the Reagan presidency. And since the fall of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Iron Curtain, uh, I think the challenge has been that it's been a coalition in search of a common enemy. And so, when you got to nine eleven, you know, I think uh, for some people there was this collective sigh of relief. You know, thank God we have a new enemy. We can keep, you know, the band can stay together, and we can, you know, play a different tune. And, you know, that just uh, channeling that um, coalition uh, towards the war on terror just really didn't didn't pan out too well. And so I think uh, there is a, a bit of a sense among conservatives. Do we have to keep the coalition together just just because we were in the trenches together for so long? And my answer to that is no. And I, I don't say that in any way that means ill will towards any party. But I think with political coalitions, it's simply inevitable that, you know, some libertarians will drift to the left and, you know, support more liberalized social positions. You know, some neoconservatives might also drift to the Democratic Party. Um, And, you know, conservatism, especially during the Trump years, seemed to at least pick up some of the the working class sort of labor votes. And I mean, I think from a 
political coalition perspective, there is nothing wrong with some right? there's not not only is there nothing wrong, I think it's just inevitable and healthy that there's a bit of reshuffling. Now, that is actually a distinct question from, um, you know, what is a conservative political philosophy? Uh, is fusionism that philosophy? How does fusionism relate to traditionalism? How does that relate to libertarianism? That's another uh, another conversation. But the shuffling of, of coalitions is normal, and it's not something I worry about too much. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, I still think that there will there will always be some aspect of the old fusionism that will that will be a part of whatever new fusionism we sort of run into, whether that's the sort of classical liberal strain in it that's um, that's sort of uh, you know generally uh, not necessarily small government for small government's sake, but limited government, right? And sort of trying to understand those bounds well. Um, but yeah, I certainly think that reshuffling is is natural. Cool. And then uh, any politicians that embody conservative principles, if so, who? Yeah, you know, I mean, it, that's that's a tough question. I think there certainly are politicians that embody conservative principles. You know, I think as we look forward to the 2024 election, keeping an eye on governors of conservative states mm-hmm. uh, will definitely be worth our while. There are many uh, uh, wonderful senators who, you know, I um, would have positive things to say about whether it's, you know, whether it's it's Rubio or Hawley or Cotton. Uh, the list could probably go on. But I also think taking a look at governors, because at the end of the day, governors actually have experience governing and senators have some of that experience, but not quite to the same extent. So I'm still kind of waiting for the day when we'll, uh, you know, when we'll when when we'll get a conservative governor at the top of the ticket. But I'm not making any predictions for 2024 just yet. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, you look at the history of sort of Republican politics. Not a lot of uh, senators go on to become presidents. So that is true. Alrighty. Well, thanks for the question, Jack. And for our listeners, if you'd like to submit a question for the next episode, just leave a review of the show wherever you are listening and leave a question in your review and we will pick one for each episode. So, Johnny. What did you think of the conversation with Yuval? Yeah, it was a, a fascinating conversations, a conversation for many reasons. One, I have always uh, looked up to Yuval as uh, an intellectual hero of mine. I actually remember um, when I first uh, made it to Washington at the American Conservative, and Yuval didn't know me uh, from Adam. And I just sent him an email one day and went to his office, uh, his national affairs office at the time, and talked to him for an hour and had a whole notepad and was asking him questions about uh, Edmund Burke and Thomas Paine and rebuilding, you know, little platoons. And we had a wonderful conversation and uh, have stayed in touch ever since then. And so, you know, I was I was excited to have you all on. Uh, I think many in our audience are probably familiar with uh, some of Yuval's thoughts when it comes to rebuilding civil society, uh, strengthening social capital. I think probably the most interesting thing for me was really hearing that the centerpiece of Yuval's book uh, was the chapter, was his chapter on uh, the university, both as an institution and campus culture uh, itself and how uh, many of the problems facing our society today emanated from what happened and what is currently going on at the university. So I found that part to be pretty illuminating for me. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, one thing that I would note, too, is that you've all, I think, is one of the most measured um, and deep thinkers in the movement right now. Um, he always is sort of very, he's, he's hesitant to categorically reject anything except for Twitter. Um, right. He, uh, he, he really wants to think deeply and say, okay, well, you know, this thing, what are the goods of it? And how do we, how do we use those goods? How do we learn from those goods instead of just sort of rejecting something we don't like or something that isn't necessarily, um, on our side of the movement wholesale. So I, I really appreciate that, um, that depth of thought that you've all has. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, I think one of the things that I really appreciated, uh, you know, we, we talk a lot here about, OK, the tension between order and liberty, you know, and how do we reconcile them? And is liberty the only end of government or are there other ends? I think it was insightful when Yuval pointed us back to the preamble of the Constitution uh, as American conservative. Uh, You know, not only is liberty, the blessings of liberty, something we seek to secure with the Constitution, but we are also aiming to form a more perfect union, to establish justice, ensure tranquility, provide for the common defense and promote the general welfare. And so I think 
within that, uh, there is a pretty holistic vision of the common good that can really be used to help us uh, determine whether or not the things that the government is doing are serving the ends uh, that our founders had intended. Yeah, it was um, it was definitely interesting to hear him reflect on that. And uh, and I hope helpful for our students. Great. Well, uh, before we jump to the interview, I want to thank all of you listeners for tuning in to Conservative Conversations with ISI. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and our mission at ISI is to educate for liberty. If you would like to join us in that mission, please rate and review this podcast and also go to ISI.org, where both students, professors, alumni and donors can get more plugged in to the work ISI is doing on campuses and around the country. Uh, with that, uh, let's get on to the interview. Good afternoon and welcome to Conservative Conversations with ISI. Uh, we are joined today uh, by our esteemed guest, Yuval Levin, who's the Director of Social, Cultural and Constitutional Studies at AEI and the Editor of National Affairs. And he's joining us today to talk about his amazing book from last year, which actually just won ISI's Conservative Book of the Year Award, A Time to Build. And uh, Yuval will be giving a keynote address at ISI's homecoming weekend on June 25th in Wilmington, Delaware at the Hotel DuPont. So hopefully everyone is vaccinated by that time and ready to come out and uh, join together and, and celebrate with Yuval and uh, hear a little bit more about his book. Without further ado, uh, welcome, Yuval, and I'll hand it over to James for the uh, the opening question. Thanks for joining us today, Yuval. I, I wanted to sort of start with, you know, we had you on once to talk about a time to build, but we'd love to, you know, for viewers or listeners who weren't able to um, to hear about what the project of the book is, if you could sort of summarize that, uh, your thesis for us there. Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me, first of all, and I, I appreciate everything ISI does, and a, a little birdie also told me that today is Johnny's birthday, and he's spending it with us, so happy <laughs> right. birthday. Uh, you. They were recording it anyway. I, I appreciate the chance. Uh, the book is it really begins from the premise that we Americans have been living for some time through something of a social crisis, um, which you can see in a variety of forms from intense partisan polarization to all kinds of culture war resentments and troubles to the problems people face in their personal lives, isolation, alienation, despair that uh, has sent suicide rates climbing, that's driven an epidemic of opioid abuse. Those kinds of dysfunctions have some common roots, but seeing those roots, getting to them and understanding our situation in a way that could help us address it takes some work. And I think part of the work it takes is making the institutions of our society that so often are invisible to us, that we like to see right through, making them a little more visible, thinking about what it is that they do, why they're important. The book is a very conservative book in that it begins from the premise that what our institutions do for us is they form us to be capable of freedom. The premise that we begin as human beings in a fallen form, imperfect, unready, that we need to be formed before we can be free, and that the institutions of our society, from family and community and school and work, all the way up to uh, national institutions and political institutions, act to form and shape us. But that in recent times, in our times, they've been failing in that work. And rather than be formative, a lot of our institutions have become performative. They've become stages and platforms for people to stand on and yell and seek visibility. Um, rather than as as molds to live within that give us the shape we need in order to be free. The book works through what that looks like in our politics, where you find a lot of politicians now running for office basically to get a platform, to, to, to get a, a bigger following on social media, a better time slot on cable news, rather than to operate within institutions. Mm -hmm. You can see it in the academy. You can see it in corporate America now very often. You can see it in some respects in our religious lives, too. And the trouble is that by failing to serve their formative functions, our institutions fail to form our social lives, fail to give us objects of devotion and loyalty and affiliation, and so leave us feeling like the institutions of our society are not there for us. They're there for other people. They're there for elites. They're there for the people who run them. And that has contributed to a crisis of confidence in American life that has everything to do with that bigger social crisis. I certainly feel sort of viscerally everything that you're saying and describing, and I think quite a few Americans do as well. 
before we jump in, you know, one area I think we really want to focus on today is the university and campus mm -hmm. culture. But before we get to that, um, what would you say are the driving political, cultural, economic forces that have flip these institutions from being formative to performative? I think there are a number of things going on. Part of this is a long-term process driven by the intense individualism of our culture that says to us not that there's a form we ought to take in the world, there's a good that we should pursue and seek to become more like, but that instead what we should want is to be more like ourselves. Mm -hmm. Every voice and force in American life is telling us to be more like ourselves. And that means that there's a kind of fracturing and fragmentation of American society that gives institutions much less of a formative and cohesive mm -hmm. role. There's also, there are technological changes that have driven us in the direction of seeing everything as a platform. Social media has put us in the habit of kind of becoming our own paparazzi and hounding ourselves for photographs all the time and thinking of ourselves in performative terms. But I also think that there's a substantive problem here, that our institutions have become corrupted in a particular way by an ideology that doesn't believe in the formative purpose of the institutions, because it doesn't begin from the conservative anthropology that says that formation is necessary, and instead wants an expressive purpose for these institutions, mm -hmm. a progressive ideology that says that's not what these are for. They're only here to offer us a platform, and ultimately that leads the institutions to fail. The institutions that become dominated by that progressive ideology fail to serve their fundamental purposes and become corrupted in ways that makes it very, very difficult for them to function as formative forces in our society. And those institutions that are most formative, the family, the university, the, the church, um, and in some, in some respects, our political and, and even uh, uh, economic institutions become intensely controversial as the culture war takes this shape. And the question of whether they exist to form us becomes itself a central question in the culture war. And I think that's just had a lot to do with how they've lost their sense of purpose and so have lost their ability to serve us in the ways we need mm -hmm. them. My question is to what extent is this Inevitable. I, I see how progressive liberalism is sort of, you know, just eviscerates all of these institutions. But even so, if you if you go back to to classical liberalism to the time of the founding, I mean, I think it, it's it's certainly true that if we could just kind of wind the clock back, build up those institutions that would have existed at the time of the founding, we we would be formed as much better people. But I, this sliding towards where we are today, it seems to me in my mind, like it's just going to be an endless cycle, cycle of sliding back down the hill. And even like when Tocqueville, you know, came to America in the 1830s and, you know, these institutions of civil society were arguably much more robust than they are today. Um, you know, there, there still is almost something, you know, it's, it seems like the, the undoing of this uh, was sort of baked into the cake as to, you know, it sort of. Tocqueville saw how, where this individualism, he saw where it would lead. And even this sort of the, the future that he kind of, you know, lamented or warned about of sort of the people are like sheep, you know, being led by this giant, powerful state, kind of all the stuff you see in Nisbet. I don't know. It's, it's hard to me, for me to imagine a future where that didn't inevitably happen. So I, yeah. I don't know. Is this just present in every human generation and we always have to restore it and then it always kind of goes to crap and we do it over and over again or like is there some sort of logic to classical and then progressive liberalism that leads to this outcome well you know this is part of why i wrote this book is so that i would find myself constantly faced with this question and every time i talk about the book and would be forced to hear myself say no this is not inevitable it is up to us in some very important respects. Now, obviously, look, this is a, con a conversation among conservatives, and we can all agree the world's going to hell. But exactly how it's going there really is up to us in some <laughs> important respects. And I don't think it is right to say that this is baked into the cake in a way that was just always getting here. I think what's baked into liberalism is a tension, a tension between, between two things that are true. On the one hand, that the human person is born fallen and imperfect and full of vice and sin and needing formation, 
That's true. And that means we need strong social institutions that begin from that premise. And so our traditionalist in a fundamental sense. And it's also true that every human person is formed in a divine image that, that means that we have certain rights as individuals that ultimately come to be expressed in the life of a society as constraints on what that society can do to us. The premise mm -hmm. of individualism and the premise of traditionalism are both true. And that means that a society that takes these premises seriously, a society that's actually trying to be liberal in a classical sense, in a conservative mm -hmm. sense, you might say, and I think conservative liberalism is not a contradiction in terms, a society that sees that as its purpose is going to live in tension, is going to constantly be arguing with itself about whether it's too individualistic or too traditionalist. I think that's good. That argument is where we live. That tension is where we have the space to thrive. Mm -hmm. And we are certainly now, as always, living with that tension. W what does it really mean to say Tocqueville in the 1830s saw this happening? He didn't say this, was, this is going to happen in 170 years. He said this is happening now. And he was right. Nisbet said it too. Nisbet said it in the early 1950s, which we now would say was the golden age of a kind of communitarian traditionalist conservatism. Um, and he was right too. And we see it now and we are right too. Now, each of these moments has its own problems. And I think in a lot of ways, ours is more serious than theirs because we've seen a greater corruption of our institutions by a more assertively corrosive kind of ideology. But it's still the case that living with that tension is what we're called to do. That does happen in every generation because the fundamental problem is the formation of the rising generation, which means that even if our grandparents did this perfectly, we would still face this challenge and so mm -hmm. would our grandchildren. So the challenge is gonna look different in every generation, but it is, I think, in, in some fundamental ways, the same challenge. And there are a lot of resources in the liberal society for contending with that challenge because at its best, that society does take seriously both the traditionalist mm -hmm. premise and the individualist premise. I, I think part of our challenge now is that we, we see the tension between those premises as a struggle within conservatism, which it rightly is. It, it often is. But in some ways, we're not alert enough to the fact that this always happens and that mm -hmm. we are living out a kind of tension that we can learn from the past about right? That if you look at the debates conservatives were having in the 1970s, they look very similar to this kind of argument between libertarians and traditionalists. You even find your Catholic integralists and, you know, the, the case against liberalism. These, these arguments all have a lot to offer us. I, I ultimately think that our society can endure in this kind of living tension, but only if we really do fight that fight. And if we do understand where the threats are in our own time, which is part of what this book is for, is to help us see that at the moment, we're living with something like the excesses of institutional weakness. And that's a very hard thing for Americans to see so that it becomes very difficult for us to know what we're supposed to be doing right now. I think that has to do with something like a recommitment to responsibility within the institutions we're part of. And mm -hmm. that's the case the book makes. Yeah, I mean, I think those are great points. And one thing, you know, I, I know we want to get to the education question, but I just want to ask one more question on the sort of the question of tension. A lot of conservatives today, and, and this was, I think you're right to say the case in the 60s and 70s as well, were calling for a more um, a more robust conser or more robust um, governmental sort of uh, path for conservatism, right? Um, a lot of people today are calling it more muscular, yep. right? And talking about how, you know, we need to be willing to use um, to to wield power in a way we haven't been willing to yield or wield power before, and this strikes me as sort of not understanding the tension um, very well, right? Um, because it seems to me that the that they're trying to impose order from a place that conservatives have traditionally thought that, well, you know, that's not um, that's not necessarily the the way to impose order. We should rather impose order in a way that still allows people to be free through civil society and family and church and these sorts of things. So how do you respond to um, to folks like that who are sort of making that push on the um, on the side of the movement? Well, look, I, I think that there's there's an important point to what they say. And I, and I agree with much of what they say. I do think there is a role for government in shaping the life of the society it governs and that our politics has to answer to an ideal of the good 
that our government cannot be neutral about. That said, I also think that it's very important to recognize that one of the great strengths of liberalism is that it it protects minorities while empowering majorities. And I think mm-hmm. some of the tenor of the arguments that you're describing in the last few years have been a function of being in power. Um, and they've come from people whose, whose experience of the political debates within the right were formed largely in the last five years in the Trump era where... Yeah. You know, we have been in power in a sense. And the question was, are we doing enough with this or are we uh, being too Mm. passive when we have the opportunity to take some action about what's happening in the universities or about uh, the 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 condition of the culture? The trouble is you're not always in power. And we're learning that lesson now. And we learned that lesson in the Obama years. If you were around, I cut my teeth in the Bush years. I worked in the Bush White House, but I'd been around in the Clinton years before that. And the the, the thing you always have to think about when you provide the government with a new power is not what can I do with this, but what is the other side of this debate going to do with this when they yeah. get a chance? And it's an important question to ask. It should not be an utterly debilitating question. It shouldn't mean that we therefore don't do anything with political mm-hmm. power, which is a risk that conservatives do run. And, you know, I, I think that uh, imagining that all that government can do is uh, kind of enforce neutral rules, well, that's just not true. I mean, read the preamble to the Constitution. That says that tells us what our government is for. And it doesn't really talk about neutral rules. That talks about an idea of human thriving that can be advanced by the right form of government used in the right ways. That's, that's very important to keep in mind. But it is also important to see that what that involves as a practical matter is very often government acting as the protector of the space in which society lives. Um, And Hmm. protecting a space does sometimes mean enforcing rules rather than taking action within that space, right? The space is where the family, to, to begin with, lives its life. It's where the community lives its life. It's where the nation lives its life. Also where the economy functions. And government has a protective role, first and foremost, to keep that space open and free. I think it also does have further roles to advance our idea of the good, provided that space remains open and free. And again, we find ourselves confronted with the need to sustain a balance. The the genius of the American system, and particularly of our constitutional system, is that it takes ideals that are in tension with each other, and it says yes to them right? Do we want this or that? Yes, we do. And so that can be very frustrating, but it, it, it begins from the assumption that we that the tension, the, the kind of dynamic tension that's created by that sort of system makes room for people to live their lives and make different kinds of choices and enable different forms of, uh, of, of, of living to take shape. I don't think that means government is neutral about how uh, we pursue the good, but I do think that there are constraints on it. And so I'm with a lot of those folks who are a lot of them are my friends who say we we should not be too passive when it comes to using public power. But we also need to be very clear about the dangers of empowering government, understanding that it isn't always going to be our friends who are using that power. Yeah, I think that's a really helpful distinction of, you know, wielding power is not necessarily problematic. It's problematic to maybe... Uh, catch yourself in a position you might regret by taking advantage of something in the moment, uh, if that make, if that distinction makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So moving uh, to the question of universities, which I think we'll, we'll want to look at two things. One, the, the institution of the university itself and how it functions, and then the culture that our, our students and professors are experiencing on campus. In terms of the- This is because we uh, haven't been depressed enough yet in this conversation, right? That's a good point. Yeah. So the uh, anyways, in terms of the institution itself, you mentioned that there are three and there's a great chapter specifically on the universities that I would encourage everyone to read. But basically three aims of universities in America today. Uh, one is vocational, you know, giving you the skills you need for a specific job. Uh, the second one is the pursuit of justice, uh, which today is most mostly understood as the pursuit of social justice and activism. And the third one is the pursuit of wisdom or liberal learning through the great books and 
philosophy and the, tradi the, the broader tradition. Uh, I would say if you look at the university system today, with the exception of a few places, uh, in terms of the, the vocational training and in terms of wisdom and liberal learning, I think we're failing pretty, pretty badly in both of those areas. You know, colleges are saddling young people with debt and they're not even really, you know, if you, even if you just go to a, your average, you know, generic state school in whatever state you happen to live and you get a four year degree, you're not really any better off than if you didn't have a degree. You know, you're saddled with debt and you're not really equipped to do anything. Similarly, most of these institutions aren't teaching people to pursue liberal learning. They're teaching people to, you know, by and large, reject their cultural uh, and philosophical and religious inheritance. So it seems to me like, one, it's a problem, you know, and we obviously want to need to fix the problem. So part of that looks like, okay, building these parallel institutions or, you know, working with groups like ISI to form kind of pockets of education and resistance from within. But structurally speaking, it also seems like it's over, you know, we're overdue for some creative destruction in this university system as a whole. So are there any, do you actually envision, given it, that this is not even fulfilling the functions for which it was largely created, like, is it possible to actually pop the university bubble and reimagine something new for education? Or are we just kind of tied down to this? this losing uh, situation? Yeah, this is a great question and a hard question. The university, um, the university in a way is at the center of the argument that I make in the book. It's, it's literally at the center. It's, it's not to be too Straussian about it, but it's in the middle chapter, uh, the fifth of nine chapters. And actually the other chapters really are built as concentric rings around the university argument. Hmm. Um, and that's because I think that the, the tr trouble we face, the culture war, we're fighting emanates from the university. Um, and also that we can't really succeed in turning the culture without some, without making some real changes in the university. Most Americans don't go to college. It's not that, that everybody gets formed that way, but elites matter enormously in shaping our culture. And the university right now deforms our elites in very profound ways that really have to be taken on. What I try to argue in the book, and, and as you suggest in, in thinking about those three purposes of the university, is that in a sense, the problem is not what universities are doing, but how. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly that there's no room for the kind of, uh, of activism that you see on campus. W working to change the culture in, uh, in moral terms has actually always been a purpose of the university in the West. Um, and certainly in America, where if you look at the, you know, the charters of the, the two original universities, Harvard and Yale in the United States, they were created basically to train men of religion to drive the larger culture to repent of its sins. It's not actually that different from what a lot of our social activists think they're doing now. They have a different religion, which, you know, which is worth talking about. I think those differences are a real problem. But in a sense, they are thinking about that. And certainly the university has a vocational purpose to give people the skills to succeed in America. And it has a kind of liberal learning purpose to expose people to the truth and to the best of our civilization. It has to pursue all three of those purposes through teaching and learning. That's what defines the university. The overarching ethic of academic life is the pursuit of the truth through, living, through, through teaching and learning. And what's happening in the university now, where it goes off the rails, is not so much in the fact that it seems to want to change the country, but that it's not going about that through teaching and learning at all. It's going about mm. that in ways that undermine and prevent teaching and learning. It's going about that in ways that close off paths to, to knowledge, that close off paths to different ideas, and ultimately that try to take a kind of ownership of elite culture rather than play a, 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 a fundamentally investigatory role or teaching role or learning role. Um, what it would mean to recover the university is to recover that ethic of teaching and learning. I, I do think that the culture of liberal education has to be at the center of that because it is committed to that ideal in a way that the other two, that vocation and this kind of pursuit of, of, of social reform aren't going to be, um, so that there's a special place for those who are committed to liberal learning in higher education in driving the university back onto its tracks. 
But there's a special place also for what I describe in the book as a party of the university that is not a party in the culture war, but that understands itself as devoted to the institutional purpose of the university. That's just not going to come from contemporary university administrators. It's going to happen only against them. It has to come from, at some level, from students, in some ways from parents, in some ways from trustees, from uh, pressure from the larger culture, even from pressure from government in some respects where we can manage that. Um, but it is ultimately a struggle against contemporary university administration, which is really where the trouble is focused. The problem in the university today is not that there are Marxist literature professors. That's just not new. And, you know, you live with it. The problem is that the people who run the universities use a certain kind of um, you know, call it identity politics, ideology as a, as a means of administration, as a source of, of as a way of exercising power. And mm -hmm. in the process, they not only deform the institution, they're also teaching an entire generation of students that this is how you run institutions, that this is mm -hmm. how you use power. And so it shouldn't surprise us that when those students then go to work at other places, at the New York Times or at a Wall Street firm or, you know, wherever Yale students go, I don't want to think about it. <laughs> um, they then have that view of what an institution is, of how the people running it should behave. And it's just deforming every institution in, in, uh, in American life at the elite level, at least. Um, so I think the struggle for the university is the core struggle. Now there are some causes for hope. I, I think it is true that these are islands of sanity, but there are a fair number of islands of sanity. Um, ISI is responsible for some of them. ISI has been doing this for a long time. It was a place where I had to reach for sanity as a college student uh, in the 1990s, and it was there, and it did it. There are now more of those. There are places for students to go, you know, for summer programs, for all kinds of things that I wish had been there when I was a college student. Um, and for conservative-minded students, but also just people looking for liberal education to find it. There are also professors, you know, we say here and there, but there's a fair number of them um, who are building little islands where they are. Um, these are forms of resistance, right? We're not taking ownership of the university. But we haven't really had ownership of the university. I think these islands matter enormously, and it is very important to see how much good they're doing and not to despair not to think that there's no point, that we're losing every battle on campus. I think we're really not. There are ways in which smart students can see through some of the shallowest kind of gruel that they're being served up right now. They're looking for alternatives. There are also ways in which a lot of students are looking for something that ultimately they're probably going to get from religion. They're looking for some mm -hmm. idea of justice. And what they're being served up in the form of contemporary social justice isn't really going to satisfy them. And we need to look at these as opportunities um, and not just as enemies, not, not simply as threats. I think if we have more of that attitude, which is what my teachers had in what was also a very hostile university environment, uh, you know, 30 years ago, or I don't want to admit how many years ago, <laughs> um, it, it's also what their teachers had in what was also in its own way a hostile university environment in a prior generation. You know, this is what it looks like, except that now, of course, we're confronting a more assertive, more aggressive, um, you know, set of forces that feel like they own the university, like they are the institution. And so there's more work to be done. There's harder work to be done, but it can be done and it must be done, because if we don't make progress there, it's going to be very difficult to get anywhere on any other front. Hmm. One thing I wanted to ask about is is uh you know count like counter educational institutions you mentioned folks places like isi you mentioned faculty who are sort of have their little islands in different universities there's a lot of you know centers and institutes cropping up but then there's also places like hillsdale college and grove yeah. city college and um ave maria right that are sort of um they're 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 kind of their own thing right and i wonder whether you think that the future um for academia is in these sort of new um, universities that are open to, you know, actually sort of being interested in truth? Um, or if if you think that we really can, I mean, can we really, yeah. is is one or two professors at Yale going to be enough to, um, to sort of push back against the tide? Yeah, look, I think we have to do both. And I think that this gets at a larger question about the challenge for the right now, the question of whether we need to be thinking in terms of alternative institutions 
or whether we need to be thinking in terms of footholds in mainstream institutions. And maybe by now it won't surprise you, but my answer is yes, we do. <laughs> um, I think that there is, first of all, what it means to focus on institutional renewal right now is not just rebuilding broken institutions, but also starting new ones. And that's very true in higher education. You know, th there was a period of, of institution formation in higher ed in the, at the end of the 19th century in America that we can learn some from. It was actually, when you look at it, it was a time when a lot of wealthy Americans sent their kids to Harvard, were horrified by what happened there. In that case, in comparison with the European research universities, and they built new universities. Um, you know, the, the University of Chicago, Stanford, Duke, Johns Hopkins, that's how these places came to be. We think they've always mm. been around, but they actually were built in late 19th, early 20th century in response to concerns about the Ivy League. Um, it would not be crazy to try now to build some new institutions in response to concerns about the Ivy League. I think that is worth trying. There are also, as you say, alternative institutions. Hillsdale is a wonderful example. That's not a new university at all. Um, and, it, it, uh, you know, I think what it's doing is enormously important. And it is really building an alternative educational culture in which people can be formed in the way that you would want people to be formed in a university. Um, that said, I think that it's important for us on the right not to not to invest in alternative institutions entirely to the exclusion of mm -hmm. footholds in the mainstream. That's true in the media where you run the risk of echo chambers and we've seen what that can look like. It's true in, uh, in the academy. It's true throughout the culture. We need to look for ways to be present in those mainstream institutions, especially because we need converts, right? We need to find young people whose parents didn't send them to Princeton to become conservatives, but who Robbie George sees on day one and says, I got my eye on you. Um, mm -hmm. That's very important. And it makes a huge difference to the future of our, uh, of not only of, of the right, but of the culture in the country, mm. that those professors be there, but also that there be these other alternatives. I don't think that these are uh, mutually exclusive and, you know, the more the merrier. We need to build ways of showing the rising generation that there is more than the gruel they are getting, that there is something better for them. And we need to do that with a sense that it is better, a sense of confidence, not fear and not despair, but confidence, a sense that we have something to offer them that they're going to want. Do you see, um, you know, it's, you mentioned how identity politics sort of shapes the, um, the logic that university uh, administrators use and wielding their power on campus. And we're seeing this now, you know, like you said, in, in journalism and in other areas of life. Do you see the pendulum swinging back to a place where these mainstream institutions say, you know what, we're right. You know, it is true that we're, we're you know, more or less liberal institutions, but we were cognizant of the fact that we need to have our token or several, you know, we need to have our Ross Douthat or we need to have our Mark Thiessen. We need our Robbie George. Like, do you see things swinging back anytime soon? Because right now it seems like we're kind of in a death spiral. Yeah. And uh, I'm hoping that we we hit a wall and sort of bounce back to a little bit more of a, I'm, you know, it would be great if we could flip these places entirely, but I don't really envision that happening. Right. But I would just love a solid contingent of right thinking people. Yeah, look, I, I think back is probably not quite the right way to think about okay. it in the sense that this doesn't happen through a realization that, oh, we actually should have more intellectual diversity here. That's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but because there is a price to be paid for going too far in a bad direction, <clears throat> I do think there are ways that these institutions get pushed back <clears throat> simply out of sheer dissatisfaction with where they've ended up. Now, that's more likely in journalism than in the academy. Um, <clears throat> I do think there is a way that a lot of people who work in journalism are increasingly unhappy with the way the institutions of mainstream journalism are run and find it ridiculous and absurd and that there, there will be and is some pushback. Now, that doesn't mean the New York Times becomes a conservative institution. It never was that, and it isn't going to be. And by the way, I think, you know, 11 progressives versus Ross Douthat is a pretty fair fight, and Ross is going to win that most days of the week. 
So, you know, we can, we can thrive that way if we need to. But I, I think in some ways, the, the bigger challenge, the bigger problem is that they need to see that there is a need to enable other kinds of voices to be heard. And I do think that they, they are beginning to get the sense that they pay a price for some of the group think they have. Now, I'm not, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not optimistic about the New York Times. Um, and so, you know, what it could look like to see some pushback on this is a kind of internal civil war that creates a little space again for some different people and different views and also economic pressures, which, you know, journalism is under intense pressure and giving up on half the country as a potential audience is, is a strange business decision. Um, and so I think at some level they feel those pressures too. But these are institutions that are rotten, that are in a lot of ways, you know, in, in very, very bad shape so that they get to a better place by failing harder rather than mm. by realizing what was wrong. Now, in the academy, you know, I, 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 they, they, they're just more immune to these kinds of pressures. I mean, the elite mm. universities don't really feel economic pressure. There are a lot of mid-tier universities that do. Um, and that as a result are often more focused on the vocational side of things or on ways of sustaining themselves, um, even though many of those also do have profound cultural problems. Um, and I think their conservative voices are going to remain an exception. I just believe in the power of what they have to offer, especially in the face of monoculture. You should not underestimate the appeal of a minority culture to a 19 year old who's sick and tired of being told the same thing by everybody from all directions. Um, monoculture is just not attractive. It's boring, uh, it's weak, and it is vulnerable. And so, yeah, the entire Princeton faculty versus Robbie George is also a fight that I would take. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, obviously it would be great to have more than that. And, and I, I can point you to a lot of friends that I had in graduate school who should be teaching at Harvard and Yale now and aren't. And they're teaching at good schools at, you know, in good liberal arts schools where they are building pockets where it is uh, worth sending your children. Uh, but they'd be more powerful and effective as forces in the culture if they were at Harvard mm -hmm. and Yale. I think there's no doubt that uh, we've seen that degradation. We should look for opportunities to push back, but you know, I wouldn't be, unrealistic, or at least too unrealistic about what can be achieved that way. I wonder if I could follow up a little bit on your um, your point about administration from earlier. You were talking about sort of a philosophy of administration that values power. I wonder if um, part of that is sort of imposing something down on professors, uh, teaching professors, as well as uh, sort of research academics, that's actually inhibiting them from you know being free to teach or being free to do research. Sure. And I wonder if um, I wonder if we could find a way. Like, do you do you foresee a a, um, a renewal of of education schools or maybe a uh, actually, you know, education schools sort of tanking because they are pushing this kind of philosophy of administration that's kind of strangling the university with, you know, a, a blow of middle administration? Yeah, look, education schools are just about the last institution in America that I would look to for hope. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's a long way down. So <clears throat> I, I don't. I don't think that that's where any kind of renewal could begin. Sure. But I do think that they're failing in their basic mission, which means that people who need them are going to look elsewhere. Um, and, yeah. you know, I think th th there are ways in which the financial pressures that universities face um, could help to fight that this kind of bloated administration, which a lot of people on a lot of campuses are unhappy about. I mean, you know, there are a lot of professors that who, who aren't, you know, on the right in any recognizable way, who, when you talk to them, are very sick and tired of the kind of pressure they get from university mm -hmm. administrators. Now, there's not much they can do about it. And look, I, I wouldn't say, I mean, I think administrators always seek power. That's not what's new here. I think what's mm -hmm. new is that they found a way to seek and use power that hides behind these kinds of ideological terms and modes and that presents itself as a way of seeking justice. That's a very, very powerful mode of administration. Um, and so, you know, they, they are really able to push people around on campus using these kinds of tools. 
Um, I do think that campus culture recoils against this some in ways that we should be thinking about using, that mm -hmm. we should be thinking about building on. But look, the, the situation is pretty dire. I mean, as I said at the beginning, I, I, I think the university is where the problems emanate from. And there are just enormous challenges to, to deal with. So one, one fun idea that I heard at our Collegiate Network Editors Conference last weekend, uh, which some particular papers have done, but I think it would be amusing if there was a, a coordinated sort of attack in this effort, is, is on the front page of the college newspaper, publishing the salaries of all the administrators on <laughs> campus and... Uh, if you were to see that countrywide, I think all of a sudden uh, the students and even the parents who are paying ridiculous amounts for tuition would begin to wonder why the, the bureaucrat to student ratio is, you know, 10 to yeah. 1 or whatever yeah. it is. So. I mean, look, running brown just isn't that hard. I, yeah. <laughs> how could it take this many people? You really do have to wonder. Yeah. One question we want to ask you before we get to some of the student questions is a question we ask all of our guests. Um, and so first... Uh, do you consider yourself a conservative? And second, how would sure you do. define that? I and certainly consider myself a conservative. Um, and, you know, I, I think of myself as a conservative without much hyphenation. You know, I'm mm -hmm. just a conservative. And among other things, I'm conservative about the meaning of that term. I think that to be a conservative means you begin from a certain anthropology. It means you begin from a sense, as I suggested at the beginning, that people are born fallen and broken um, a sense, therefore, that's rooted in our religious traditions in the West, that we require formation in order to be free, that the institutions of formation are always at risk and therefore are the things we strive to conserve, mm. the family, religion, uh, community, and politics, um, that conserving those is a constant effort in every generation and that it means reminding people of their purpose and their value and that means pointing people to the, the treasure that we are fortunate to be inheritors of. That's what conservatives do. We start from the good and try to use it to address the bad. And I just pasted a link to your thousand word essay on what is conservatism that I commissioned from you uh, almost a year ago now. So hopefully. This year's felt like 20 link. years. So I. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, well, I think we can bounce over to some of the student questions now. They're sort of piling up here. All right. We have a question about civil institutions from Kurt Byron. And Kurt asks, is not the weakening of many of our important civil institutions a function of the progressive project to make the federal government bigger and bigger? Yeah, as I suggested at the beginning, I, I think that's right. And I would say more than that, I, I think that the the individualism that has been at the heart of some of the of the social transformation we've been talking about is deeply tied to the growth of centralized power. These are two sides of one coin. This is really the insight of Robert Nisbet, um, particularly in the quest for community, but in a, in, in a lot of his other work, <clears throat> that we should not think of individualism and centralization as opposites, but that they work in tandem and that they both end up undermining what lies in the middle between the individual and the national state, which is civil society um, from family and community up. And because I think that those are where we really thrive and where we really live and that ultimately the purpose of politics is first and foremost to sustain those, um, I do think that both centralization and an excess of individualism um, are dangerous to our society. And the combination of centralization and excessive individualism, which seem like opposites, is actually roughly what modern progressivism is. Um, and so I think that, that that kind of combination is really a danger to, uh, to American civic life and civil society. And conservatism has to see the ways in which, look, there, there is real value in individualism. There is also a real need for a national government. And so we shouldn't be extremists about either of those, but we need to see that ultimately it is by keeping them in balance in a way that sustains the middle layers that we can succeed in governing ourselves. That's what's most needed. Yuval, we've got a, another question from Giovanni Desir, who uh, asks about your thoughts on schools today returning 
to, in, in his view, what they once were in the 20th century in terms of teaching vocational skills that young people can use to get a job and set and be set with a career rather than everyone going to colleges and universities and getting into debt. So what are your thoughts on how we could reform vocational education and what would that look like? Yeah, I, I think there's I think there's a real need for that. I mean, the, the idea that the way into the middle class is college, period, doesn't serve our country very well. There's, mm-hmm. a, there's an important need for college. There's a use for college. And it should be available to people wherever they begin in our society. But it's not what everybody wants and it's not what everybody needs. And we shouldn't really want to change that. But we should think about how to design educational institutions that do serve people better. I think in part that means more vocational options, particularly at the high school level, um, and more things like apprenticeships, which sound old fashioned, but are actually a pretty good fit for a lot of what the modern economy requires in a lot of places in America. Um, and, you know, I think the, the rigid model um, of K through 12, where each grade is understood as a path to the next and 12 is understood as a path to college is not exactly right for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, in part, what that means is that we should have more educational options in general. And I don't think that we that the kind of European style shoving people into tracks would work in America. Um, We just we believe in freedom and we believe in individuals. And I don't want to become the German education system. Um, But I think we've got to find ways that are suited to our way of life that give people more options and choices that look Mm -hmm. like vocational training. And, you know, vocational is not a bad word. I mean, that means you have the skills to succeed. Um, oftentimes it can be a path to a better life than a college education would be for many people. Um, and clearly we're underinvested in that both publicly and privately. And do you see uh, on a, on sort of the flip side of that coin, do you see, especially, you know, given your, your work at AI, I mean, do you see fortune 500 companies ever getting to a point in the near future where they say, you know what, forget Forget college that I mean, not forget it, because they're probably always going to hire, you know, graduates of top colleges, but say, hey, look, college is no longer a requirement to apply. If you will take you will recruit, we'll go into the best high schools, recruit right away, put you through a year long training where you learn how to write, you learn, you know, whatever, how to use Excel, PowerPoint and basic culture of the company. Yeah. And then I don't know, that would seem like it would make sense to me. Do you see Fortune 500 companies well, moving in that direction? You would think. I mean, I, I would say there are some companies, particularly involved in manufacturing, who have done some of that in the United right. States. Um, you know, you can find automakers in the South um, c- kind of coming to agreements with South Carolina in particular has been good about this, mm-hmm. um, where they create their own training programs. Sometimes they're connected to uh, to a community college system, but sometimes they're not. And where they just provide high school graduates with uh, a path to a job, to you know, to a, to a, to, to to good employment, without requiring college. What happens, unfortunately, is that in a lot of ways, college is a kind of signaling mechanism, right? It tells the employer that this is somebody who passed the test once and who, you know, got up on time enough mornings to get through college, and so there's a decent chance that maybe he or she can also uh, be a good worker, and. You know, it's a very, very expensive way to send that particular signal, let alone, Mm -hmm. um, you know, putting these students through four years of indoctrination to get to send that particular signal. So I do think there are better ways, but the incentives right now are not well aligned for employers to do that. They're very happy having, um, you know, parents and taxpayers pay huge amounts of money to get these kind of certificates of I can get up in the morning, go to work. And then begin from there. And, you know, as long as those incentives look that way, I think it's hard to see. So uh, we have a couple of questions about social media in general. And I'm wondering, and you know, you, you touch on this a bit in your book. And I'm wondering if you could um, if you could talk a little bit about whether or not you think that there's a way to like to redeem social media as not strictly a performative institution. I mean, you know, we had, uh, I don't know if you know, Will Duffield over at Cato, but we had him here for a debate last week on big tech. And he was sort of talking about how he thinks that there is going to be a more, you know, plural sort of social media institutions, which will be smaller and they will be more community based, et cetera, et cetera. He had a very hopeful outlook on it. I wonder if we could get uh, your take on whether or not there's a sort of hope 
for social media? Yeah, so, you know, I'm a conservative, not a libertarian, so I'm just not that optimistic about technology. But I and, and, and I would say also at the moment, just looking at it, social media is the spawn of Satan. I mean, it is ruining our society in countless ways. Um, that doesn't mean it has to stay that way, but it is that way. Um, and, you know, I... I say that even not having to see the worst of it. I shield myself from some of it. I'm not on Twitter, for example, though I'm on Facebook. I also think that there's a way in which social media now distorts our political culture. I mean, let me tell you about my experience on Facebook. I'm, 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 I'm an odd bird on Facebook. I have two worlds that are pretty separate from each other. On the one hand, I'm a, uh, I'm, I'm a, I'm a Jewish, foreign-born PhD who grew up in New Jersey and lives in Maryland. So I know a lot of people on the left. I mean, like, really on the left. Um, and I don't agree with them, but they're friends, and some of them are Facebook friends. I'm also a conservative and have worked in the conservative world now professionally for two decades and live in that world, and it's where I find people who are like-minded and who I think are doing the right thing. So a lot of them are friends and Facebook friends. On Facebook, these two worlds are completely separate and distinct. They're not even angry at each other. They're each angry at something that the other has never heard about. And they think they're angry at each other. They completely miss each other. Um, that's a problem that's evident beyond social media, but that is made much worse by social media. And if you think the purpose of our politics is to compel some accommodation and compromise and bargaining in a society where people are always going to differ, then social media is really a scourge. Um, it also deforms our, our habits. I mean, as I suggested before, and as you said in the question, it turns us into performers, right? We're enjoying something and the thought suddenly occurs in the back of our minds. How's this going to look on Facebook or how do I get the right angle here for posting this? And it's just, I'm not saying I never do this myself. I'm just saying this is terrible. It's terrible. Um, it is really a way to ruin your life. And mm. I, I think it's certainly possible that because it's so terrible, and look, a lot of people feel that increasingly, that it is possible that people will seek different ways of using social media and that these institutions will evolve some and we will see more forms that are more communal, that are smaller, that uh, are a little bit more like actual human interaction. So it, it's possible that a greater diversity of options could make this work mm. for us. Mm. But it has to be said that at the moment, social media is a scourge and you would do well to avoid it. And mm -hmm. my advice to everyone is certainly to, to, to professional people in the world I work in, stay off Twitter. It only does you harm. And, mm -hmm. you know, it puts you in a position to expose your worst self to the world. I just don't see why that's something we should want. So I guess we won't be catching you on Clubhouse at 2 a.m. Uh, anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Look, I, and, I, and it's not that I don't think I'm missing something by staying yeah. away, but I just think you have to be careful about how you form yourself. And mm -hmm. that means mm -hmm. thinking about w where you are and what you're doing there. Yeah, you you might not be uh, you might not be missing anything, but you might be gaining some sleep. So uh, yeah, that so. too. <laughs> Uh, you know, we're, we've got about six minutes left. Pivoting to a little bit different direction, we haven't talked about Congress at all. Mm -hmm. And I know the approval of Congress is, is at an all-time low and probably continuing to skyrocket. And I mean, I think this is, this gets to your, you know, point about performative institutions. You know, I really don't know. I mean, with the exception of, you know, you have someone like Ben Sass who is, an ardent institutionalist, you know, and that's sort of, that's his brand. That's what he wants to restore the Senate. But, you know, you, you have a lot of other people who, you know, again, it's sort of like, what, what is, con I'm oversimplifying and, you know, this is a generalization, but it's like, what do they really do? You know, like you get this position in Congress and it's really just a platform. So you can do, you know, these quick hits on, on Fox or MSNBC and, and you know, basically upload to your Twitter and Facebook account your your video grilling you know someone in a hearing to get more you know boost your fundraising. So yeah, I get I, so I don't know. So one, 
I don't know. What are your general thoughts on that? And then, yeah, I mean, look, grid, is this gridlock and oh, this is gridlock and it's healthy. They're not doing anything. So like, that's the way it's supposed to work. Or is there something actually really wrong? Well, it's worth thinking about what we mean when we say the gridlock can be healthy. But and even more than that, I, I would say, first of all, Congress has never been popular. Right. And, and just given the realities of a democratic society, Congress is never going to be popular. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I, I think if you had checked in on America at any point in the 19th century, uh, you know, just read what people were writing about Congress, it wasn't so different from how we think about it. Now, there was a kind of moment in the middle of the 20th century when Americans just had a really high opinion of everything. And mm-hmm. that included Congress, but only, I mean, even at the heights in the early 70s, when you find confidence in institutions at its highest, confidence in Congress is still, you know, in the 30s. Um, oh, wow. It's now in the teens, in the low teens. And even that, I mean, you wonder really, who are those people and what are they thinking? Um, That said, when we say Congress is failing, we have to ask ourselves, what is Congress failing to do? What is Congress supposed to do? The answer to that is actually has become rather counterintuitive, it seems to me. I would say, reading the Constitution, reading the framers, thinking about American history, that the purpose of Congress is to compel accommodation among competing and differing factions in our society. Hmm. That's its purpose. That's what it's for. It's the it, it, it's an arena of compromise and accommodation, and it is designed to force that accommodation because otherwise it wouldn't happen. And there's no other such arena in our national politics. That's not what the courts are for. That's not, although sometimes they pretend it is, that's not what the executive branch is for. Um, and it couldn't be. It's a, it's a unitary branch. It's one person who are you going to compromise with. Congress is there to compel compromise. And that means that to the extent that it is failing, which is a great extent, that's what it's failing to do. Hmm. If that's the case, then you've got to think about what do reforms look like? So I would say if the problem is our system requires a lot of cross-partisan bargaining, but right now we're having a lot of trouble achieving that, you could go in one of two directions. You could try to look for reforms that make cross-partisan bargaining less necessary, or you could look for reforms that make it more likely. The left wants the first. They're, they're sick of the system that says Congress is there for bargaining. They want something more like a parliamentary system where the majority party just runs everything until the, the public throws it out. And then the other party runs everything. That's not our system. And it's never been our system because the insight of our system is there needs to be an arena for bargaining and compromise. And so I think that we on the right should want reforms that enable more accommodation to happen. That means not getting rid of the filibuster, which is exactly the left's kind of approach that says we need to make bargaining less necessary, Mm -hmm. but rather looking for ways to make the work that legislators do more significant to them, more of a channel for their ambition in such a way that they would have both more opportunities to bargain and more reasons to. Some of that is actually electoral reform in my view. I mean, I think we need more factions within the parties both mm-hmm. parties now are much too cohesive and they don't think about bargaining because they don't have internal factions that understand themselves independently. There aren't, uh, there's no real portion of the Democratic Party that wants to talk to Republicans. Uh, you know, Joe Manchin is it. I, I, I think that there are ways of thinking about our elections that could help more of that happen in both parties. Things like ranked choice voting, which we think of as belonging to the left, I think would actually help the right a lot more than the left. Uh, and it's really worth talking about. But there are also changes in Congress, changes to the budget process, getting rid of the distinction between authorization and appropriation, in empowering committees over leadership. These are ways of allowing legislating to matter. And the only way you're going to get an ambitious person to not spend all his time talking on cable news or talk radio is by giving them something else to do that seems like mm-hmm. it could be a channel for ambition. And that's what Congress lacks now. Well, on that note, um, we are out of time. So thanks again for you all for joining us. Thank you. Three action items for you in the audience. The first is to purchase a copy of A Time to Build by Basic Books. The second is to go to isi.org backslash homecoming and purchase a ticket for homecoming weekend, especially for Friday night to hear you all's talk at the Conservative Book Award. And the third thing is to go to Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to Conservative Conversations with ISI. Uh, So with that, uh, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.